I'm Indy Nidell, and this is another exciting episode of Out of the Trenches, where I sit here in my chair of wisdom and answer all your questions about the First World War. Uh, Giannis Christodoulou, or Christodoulou, sorry if I'm pronouncing it wrong, which I probably am, but anyhow, Giannis. Uh, Hi again. I have a question about the Olympics of 1916. They were to be held in Berlin, right? Did the Germans cancel them or the IOC, the International Olympic Committee? Uh, What was the story behind those games and how the world reacted to that? The International Olympic Committee gave the rights to Berlin for the 1916 Olympics uh, in 1912. And Germany began preparing to hold the Summer Games and even a newly created month of Winter Games. In 1913, they opened a new stadium in Berlin, the German Stadium, which is the predecessor of today's Olympiastadion. Uh, The president of the IOC, Baron Pierre de Coubertin, um, favored Germany because he saw it as a country that embodied the spirit of the Olympics, which was, at the time, higher, stronger, faster. Baseball magnate uh, Albert Spaulding sailed on the Lusitania to Germany, well sailed, he went on the Lusitania to Germany in 1914 and thought that all inner European struggles were seemingly forgotten as everyone was spending a lot of money to beat the Americans in sports. Uh, The IOC under Coubertin sincerely hoped that the spirit of Olympia would bring Europe together as it seemed to be drifting apart. As the war broke out, the IOC was very quickly debating transferring the games to another country, most likely the USA. But as many others did, leaders of the IOC thought the war would never last into 1916. Finally, they had to cancel the games entirely. Germany would regain their rights to hold the games uh, in 1931 when it was chosen for the Berlin Olympics in 1936. Uh, Warwick Eng writes, Uh, Hey, Indian crew, I have a small question for Out of the Trenches. What was the immediate reaction of the German troops when they saw the tanks coming their way towards them? Were they expecting it? Or perhaps they had a way to counter the tanks in the meantime? Cheers, love the show. Okay, I'm I'm gonna do a quote here, right? From Peter Hartz, The Great War. German Sergeant Weinert wrote, A man came running in from the left, shouting, There's a crocodile crawling into our lines. The poor wretch was off his head. He had seen a tank for the first time and had imagined this giant of a machine rearing up and dipping down as it came to be a monster. It presented a fantastic picture, this colossus in the dawn light. One moment its front section would disappear into a crater with the rear section still protruding. The next, its yawning mouth would rear up out of the crater to troll slowly forward with terrifying assurance. Many described the first tanks, literally, as roaring beasts of steel. And in the first months, they became a weapon of terror, more so uh, than maybe than their actual impact on the battlefield. Uh, Most people were terrified, although there were, of course, courageous soldiers that tried to take them out in nearly suicidal attacks. It took a while until soldiers got used to the sight and pioneers and artillerymen found a way to deal with the tanks, at least as best as they could. But rumors and tales spread like wildfire through the German army and had a big effect on morale. Comparable terror to, say, the first experience of gas, of planes firing into the trenches, and and flamethrowers, right? Uh, Darkloaf writes, Great show. I've been binge-watching it for a while now. I have a question for Out of the Trenches. I was looking at different types of barbed wire in a barbed wire book. Really? Okay. That's a nice way to spend your Saturday evening. Let's get a barbed wire book. Uh, And I was surprised to learn there were over 400 types of barbed wire in just one museum. The book I read, you should write in the comments what the book is when you see this answer. The book I read featured mostly civilian barbed wire, but it got me thinking. Could you show pictures of various types of barbed wire used in the war? There had to be more types than just glidden wire. I never see close-ups of barbed wire in World War I picture books. Considering that artillery shells were being designed to destroy barbed wire, 
I imagine there was a technological race with barbed wire as well. Oh, there was, indeed. Um, at the beginning of the war, barbed wire was pretty much what you call glidden wire. Steel fence wire with pointy ends which would entangle itself in the clothing of the soldier or cause horses to stumble, right? Um, as the war progressed, all sides invented and manufactured different forms of barbed wire for different purposes. You had simple wire, which was spun like a net over the ground, which would hinder soldiers just for the fact that they had to take their time crossing it. Um, you had barbed wire with sharp endings that would entangle itself in the uniform and cause bleeding wounds if the soldier tried to untangle himself by force. The Germans built razor sharp wire that resembled a set of teeth. The Ottoman Navy would build bigger sets of wire that were able to catch smaller boats uh, in Persia, as did the Entente forces in Africa. Barbed wire uh, in itself was more to hinder the soldier and to stop an advance dead in its tracks, not to kill per se. You, you couldn't really design shells against it, and shrapnel shells were totally useless. All the artillery could really do was to bomb barbed wire positions with enough high explosive shells to dig up the earth and hope that the wire was cut in the process, but that didn't always happen. If you'd like to see our special about tanks themselves, you can click right here for that. Do not forget to subscribe if you have not already done so, so you never miss anything. And like us on Facebook and, you know, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, because Flo, say hi, Flo. Hi. Flo, our social media guy, puts all kinds of cool stuff up there. See you next time.